Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 489 of the podcast and it is Friday the 15th of May 2020 as I record this on day 53 of lockdown here in the UK. Now technically we have had a slight relaxation this week but nothing's changing in my world and that's okay as I am busy. In fact, I'm just just getting busier than ever. It's crazy. I think all the uh, various c- conferences have all moved online now and a lot I'm doing a lot more of them <laughs> over May and June in the summer so uh, interesting times but I am busy creating and walking and making a lot of soup uh, as I, I think I mentioned we bought a soup maker and uh, we are using it every day it's wonderful it's, it's the best gadget So today I'm talking about the seven-figure, one-person creative business with Elaine Pofelt. And basically, you can have a thriving business with great income, but still remain small and nimble and have a good lifestyle. I'm very interested in this. I have, I've always talked about scalable income, how I, uh, I love working with freelancers, but I don't want any employees. I don't want to have an office. I don't want to have to deal with all that. Uh, uh, But I do like money (laughs) And, and I know you guys do too. And, um, even if you're not aiming for seven figures, then uh, six figures or whatever you're aiming for, this is more about the sort of things, the attitudes and some ideas for different potential income streams for uh, some people who want to keep a small business but still make more money. And if you're interested in this area, I also recommend the seven figure small podcast, which used to be called Unemployable, (laughs) but now it's called Seven Figure Small, which is kind of the same idea. And Elaine's been on that show as well, as have I. Uh, So that is coming up. So the biggest news in the last week is the launch of Apple Books for Authors, which is a hub for authors who want to publish direct on Apple with tips and details on how to write, publish, market and sell your ebook and audiobook on Apple Books. And you can go to app authors.apple.com and uh, there are videos from really successful authors with tips and tutorials and they've gathered everything in one place so a lot of what they've got there is not new I mean I've been on Apple for years and I use most of what they've linked there but they've put it all in one place which makes it much more easy to use especially if you want to go direct to Apple and uh, you can't find stuff It, it definitely was complicated in the past but very very good news and this is a change you can now publish direct to Apple Books with a PC. Up until now, it's been Mac only, uh, but now you can actually go with a PC. So have a look at that. Obviously, many people who have PCs use distributors like Drafts Digital, Publish Drive, Smashwords, etc. But uh, if you want to go direct, now you can. So this is a great development. Uh, it's also interesting because, of course, this year, uh, Google Play have obviously started pushing more for direct publishing. And I think the pandemic will only accelerate these type of changes as companies realise the potential in digital book sales. Uh, Of course, Apple has audiobooks as well. They link to various partners, including Findaway, who are sponsoring the show today. I'll come back to that in a minute. But uh, essentially, they uh, have everything in one place. So that is authors.apple.com. I also wanted to mention, I I really think uh, if you're wide, as I publish wide, then uh, I've been doing a lot of BookBub ads. And these are the little pay-per-click ads, um, not the deals. So, you know, you pay smaller amounts to get um, Apple buyers. So to advertise on Apple, BookBub ads are great. Because there's no KU on Apple Books, the buyers are very happy to pay. And so even though you might sell less in volume, you make up for in revenue because these are buyers, not borrowers. And you're not competing with the, in inverted commas, free Kindle books, um, KU books, I mean. So I really like Apple as a platform. I think it is a one that a lot of people ignore because it is 
often dominated by traditional publishing, but uh, on the front page. But the front page is not everything that's selling. So uh, there are lots of interesting things you can do with Apple if you look at other forms of ad- advertising. I think people get a bit obsessed with Amazon and Amazon ads, but remember there are lots of other things you can do. So if you do want to go wide, look at BookBub ads, Facebook ads, that type of thing. Uh, Ingram Spark has also updated their site and added something interesting, free ISBNs, which will help with the costs of using Ingram. Now, I will be sticking with my own ISBNs for Curl Up Press, but if this has been a sticking point for you, you can now get free ones just like uh, KDP Print. So if you want to go wide with print, you can with Ingram and the costs are now lower. Uh, They have a blog post about the updates and the new online book design tool, more user-friendly dashboard and uh, things. So links in the show notes or just go to the ingramspark.com blog and uh, you'll find it in there. And finally, Nielsen is reporting that people are reading more in lockdown. Yay! As reported in the bookseller, two-fifths of adults are reading more (laughs) two-fifths. Are reading more since lockdown started. Nearly, uh, they doubled the amount of time they spend reading books from around three and a half hours per week on average to six. A third of people said they read more printed books, 18% consumed more ebooks, and 9% listened to more audiobooks. A third of respondents said they had increased their time spent reading books to children. So that's awesome. There's also been a few articles around about the type of books that people want to read. And this survey showed little interest in dystopian fiction or titles relating to the pandemic. <laughs> And two thirds of those reading or listening said they are turning to crime, thrillers or popular fiction and non-fiction, food and drink, history, puzzles, quizzes, gardening and DIY and mind, body, spirit books. So and I was I, I picked up a few things around the social medias this week as well that although books that have come out like Peter May, I think, had a book come out that he had written years ago that happened to have a lockdown in and a pandemic and that's come out. I actually clicked on it and started to read it and then I just thought, you know what, I, I just can't read this. And it's interesting interesting because because I I just want to get on with my life I don't want to be obsessed with the pandemic all the time and I have enough of that news without having it in my fiction so I I want to read escapist stuff I'm reading oh, I'm reading all kinds I just read uh, Eden by Tim Lebon who's a, who's a horror slash thriller writer I really like his books and uh, that was great and um you know still people dying <laughs> but in a very different way. <laughs> so, and I was reading um, in the bookseller as well that uh, the sort of thoughts are that people want up, uplit and romance and happy things. I don't know. I think it's personal preference uh, as usual. I don't think if you're a thriller and horror reader like me, you're going to switch genres massively. There's enough hope for me in the horror genre. <laughs> And I know people who don't read horror don't understand that. But if you're a horror reader, you understand the hope in a horror book because it is killing the monster. And uh, I don't know how I got on this tack. Anyway, the point being that people are changing their reading habits. So reflect on yours and carry on writing what you love anyway. This is the thing. I've had a few emails this week, people saying, should I reference the pandemic in the book I'm writing? Because it's set in the... in now, uh, you know, our culture and everything. Personally, I, I'm not even going to mention it. I mean, I don't mention politics. I don't mention the state of the health service. I don't mention lots of things that are in normal life in my thrillers. I don't have to. If you're writing a slice of life or I don't know, if you're writing something that is about it, then of course. But I don't think you have to include it. Like I'm not going to have Morgan Sierra wearing a mask as she heads out to find the next thing. I'm just not going to do that. And I don't know, I in cultures that have been wearing masks for a while, in, you know, China and a- different Asian countries, I don't know whether they reference mask wearing in their books. I mean, maybe that will be a future thing. But for now, I'm not changing the way I write. But again, personal choice. So in my personal update, I finished the 
big edit of Map of the Impossible. I rewrote the ending and I'm much happier with it. And I went back into earlier scenes to foreshadow, um, adding a few touches here and there. And now I've got to read it again to see if I've overtouched. <laughs> but, um, you know, the ending must be surprising, but inevitable. And to make it inevitable, often that means you have to touch in some foreshadowing, uh, some symbolism or other things that mean when the ending happens, the reader goes, oh, yeah, of course, that was going to be the ending, even though it's still surprising. And um, I know that sounds hard when you're starting out, but trust me, over time, you can see how writers do this. And it's not, you know, you, when you're a reader, you think, oh, it's so clever that they that they put that thing in. But the point is, when you're writing, you can just put it in later. <laughs> <laughs> which is good. Uh, so I'm much happier with the book. Uh, the, the main character arc is clear across the, the trilogy, but I've still left the world open for other stories. And uh, I have on my desk the second printout, which will, and then th this edit is less of an edit. It's more just a read through. And I'll, you know, I'll, I judge it more by how many black marks there are on a page, as in in pen, <laughs> rather than just typing. Uh, and I will, you know, there'll usually be four or five maybe 10 tiny marks on a page and there'll be typos or word changes or this, that and the other, but they but they won't be significant. Once that's done, I'll send it to Jen, my editor and first reader for her comments, and then we shall see. Uh, I have set up the pre-order on Map of the Impossible and I've started planning promotions for book one, Map of Shadows, uh, in order, and I haven't done any promotion on these books, like, well, very little. I mean, I've obviously emailed my list when they came out, but I've been waiting to complete the trilogy because really, Realistically, these are not standalone books. You know, you can read them standalone, but they're much better in a trilogy. And so I was now I've got the, the it complete. I'm going to bring out the big guns. I haven't done a sort of big gun promotion in a while, but it means, you know, spending some money on some promotion in a specific week and trying to drive sales of book one in order to get sales of book two and pre-orders on book three. So that is the plan. Uh, and I'll share that, obviously, once I uh, once I do it. Uh, I also did a video this week on my JF Pen Facebook page. So that's facebook.com forward slash JF Pen author. Uh, I think that's right. <laughs> so I did a, I've been wanting to, to focus on JF Pen for a while. And, you know, uh, for the last decade, so the, la the 2010s have really been about me escaping my job. I left my job in 2011, but I took a pay cut. And then by 2015, I'd made back the money. Jonathan left his job. We moved. We we made a life. And so the last decade, we've made a life from the creative pen. And I've sold fiction, absolutely. But my focus has been on making sure we had enough money to do the things we wanted to do. And we, we sold our last property in, I can't remember, but it was over a decade ago when we sold our last property and then we bought this house. And I feel like we're stable enough that I can really, really focus on JF Penn now. So um, I am going to do lots of things. I've set up a new YouTube channel for JF Penn. I'll be doing more videos. Books and Travel podcast is now under JF Penn. Um, and I want to do more live video. So I posted this one this week, where do you get your ideas? And because this is the number one question we get as authors, right? Where do you get your ideas? And uh, of course, the secret is ideas are everywhere. Execution is difficult. <laughs> but um, in the interview coming up, Elaine mentions the pandemic is pushing the reset button on the world and that to get to the next level you have to take a step back and think and plan instead of just doing all the time. So I'm actually taking this time, this is why I feel like I'm busier but I'm I'm happier than ever actually. What's That's what's weird. It's really come full circle this situation for me. I feel like right now I'm really glad that I've got some time to think about what I want for the next decade, the 2020s. I thought I had thought about it, but now I think I haven't. <laughs> so I am revamping my business plans for fiction and for nonfiction. So I've got an author business plan for JF Penn and I've got an author business plan for Joanna Penn. And these are two, obviously two different plans. Fiction and nonfiction are quite different. So after this novel goes to the editor, I'm going to do another mini course called your author business plan. And I'm going to go through both of those. So I hope that's going to be useful. I was thinking about how do I help you guys with this? And I think I'm just going to make it a mini course. So keep an eye out for that. 
uh, sometime in June, probably. But I'm really, I just feel very excited because I, I'm taking a step back and going, right, the last decade was making the Creative Pen Limited kind of work and earn money. And now I feel more stable in the career. I'm going to take it, take more of a chance with JF Pen, basically. So that will be happening. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Everybody loved Larry's interview. Lots of great comments on YouTube. Thanks to everyone on YouTube. Chloe says, thank you for this podcast. I think when you're starting out, you don't know how difficult it could be. You're totally right. (laughs) I believe with any creative career, there is always a type of risk. I loved his ideas. And when you think about it, it's what makes stories work. I believe as creatives, we have some guidelines or principles we have to follow, but we can approach them creatively. And I'm learning as much as I can. Uh, Me too. And that's uh, really what I find. I've got a whole load of craft interviews coming up because of my refocusing on JF Penn. And I really love talking to people about this because it helps you think about your own thing. Even if you think you know the basics. I mean, I know how to write a novel. Of course I do. I've written loads of them, but I'm still, I want to write a better story. I want to become a better craftsperson. That is my goal. And so learning, even if you just get one idea, it's worth it, right? Uh, What else we got? Thanks to Kristen for the lovely smiling picture from rural Wisconsin holding two of my books. Always nice to see pictures of books in the wild. I think I've cut this off, but it might be Ron... (laughs) Somebody Howard, anyway, I've cut I've cut this off at the Appy Writer on Twitter says, listening to the podcast from the depths of my shed, man cave, home office, happy place. Uh, fantastic. Oh, Sarah Madison said, uh, I had a cry this week too. <laughs> and thanks to everyone who said, am I okay? Yes. Oh, I just had a little, you know, just, just tired, just fell over. But uh, yes, yeah, Sarah says, she also had a cry and crying helps. It really does. Says, I'm plotting my first novel and I love John Truby's 22 Steps. Indeed, Truby is fantastic. And also bought full access masterclass and got amazing advice from Brown, Baldacci, Patterson and more. I think the masterclass that um, James Patterson particularly is great. Dan Brown's is also great. But I think Patterson for me, I've watched it twice now and I'll probably do it again. And you, I'm, I actually downloaded his examples of an outline because uh, they're not really, really detailed. They just help the story go in a certain direction. So yeah, really good. Masterclass.com. Uh, Gladys Strickland says, I always learn lots from the podcast, but the latest episode with Larry gave me so many ideas for revising my work in progress. Listen and take notes. Thank you, Gladys. Um, Oh, and Sue Levin said, wow, first podcast where I went back to re-listen and take copious notes. Thank you, Joanna and Larry. Super. And remember, there is a transcript. Uh, If you go to thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast, you can find the episode and there's a transcript. So if you want to go back and check anything, you can always find that. And oh, just two more pictures. PJ Parker said, uh, sent some pictures. My daily walks along a canal, but my canal is in Providence, Rhode Island. Lovely pictures there. And Sarah Nicholas, who also sent a lovely smiling picture. I really do love seeing pictures of where you're listening to the podcast. So definitely send them, even if it is your sink while you're washing up. (laughs) Although you probably have wet hands if you're doing that. So today's show is sponsored by Findaway Voices, which I use to distribute my wide audiobooks to library apps, subscription services, and to help me sell direct as well. As all the largest uh, platforms out there, you can use Findaway to get to Audible, Apple Books, Kobo, Walmart, Storytel, Google Play, Scribd, and many more retailers. And uh, the library apps are what I find particularly exciting at the moment, as I've talked about with uh, the pandemic. People are borrowing books from their libraries. And if your ebooks and audiobooks are in there, they are going to borrow yours. Uh, and of course, you can get my <laughs> audiobooks in library apps through Findaway. <laughs> now, Findaway can help you uh, find the best way to produce your audiobook. You can narrate yourself, which is uh, some of what I've done. You can work with a narrator privately, then upload the audiobook for distribution and sale, which I've also done. It's super, super easy. 
Uh, you can also use their full service production model or use Voices Share, which is a royalty split deal. You do not have to be exclusive to any retailer and you can control your price. This is the magic button, really, because the problem with audiobooks is the marketing side. It's not as developed as the ebook marketing ecosystem. If you can control your price, you can take part in promotions like Chirp Books run by BookBub, uh, which means uh, which you can only do if you're wide because you have to be able to discount your book, which you cannot do if you are exclusive to the big player. Uh, now, uh, the other, let's say the other big player. <laughs> so last month, I actually did a Chirp Book promotion on book uh, with BookBub and I put out some BookBub ads on Chirp and Apple and uh, shifted lots of my thriller end of day. So I was really happy with that. Find a way also do monthly promotions with libraries and other retailers that you can submit to. And um, that's exciting too. So I use Find a Way for all my wide audio books. I love the platform. I love the freedom to create and sell my audio to the world. They are just doing a fantastic job. So if you want to see the possibilities for your book projects, check it out at findawayvoices.com. This type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing of the show. But my time is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, especially in these difficult times. Thanks to new patrons, Laurel Mildred, CJ Fritz, Holly Starkey, who's actually a returning patron. Thank you, Holly. Uh, Barry Carter. Joy Shui Sarangi and Sue Levin. I really, oh, and Heather Kelly. <laughs> Sorry, it's over a page. Sorry, Heather. <laughs> uh, so I really appreciate your support on Patreon. It demonstrates you want the show to continue, which is always in, <laughs> it's always in some kind of flux as I approach a big number. And we are not far off episode 500, which is when I start considering whether I want to do another 100 shows. <laughs> At the moment, I'm pretty committed, but um, your support on Patreon makes me more committed. Um, If you support the show for even just a couple of dollars a month, you'll get the extra Q&A audio, which I really need to do this week. Um, So sign up and you'll get all the backlist audio as well at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Elaine Pofelt is an independent journalist, editor and professional speaker specialising in careers and entrepreneurship. She's also the author of The Million Dollar One Person Business. Make great money, work the way you like, have the life you want. Welcome, Elaine. Thank you so much, Joanna. It's great to be here. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. And this is such a killer book title. But first of all, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. Oh, wow. That's a great question. I think I was born a writer. I started writing stories, short stories when I was in kindergarten. Um, And I always um, was one of those kids who was on the school newspaper or the literary magazine. And I continued that into college. And then um, I started my career as a newspaper reporter, morphed into a magazine reporter. Um, And then I when I had my third of my fourth children, I went freelance in 2007 and I haven't looked back. That's fantastic. And the book is so good. I, I read it when it first came out. I think I had it pre-ordered on the Kindle because I was like, yes, million dollar one person business. I want that. <laughs> so. Oh, great. Yeah, I think I think everybody does. I mean, the, the vast majority of one person businesses will not get to one million. But I do think that every business um, can be optimized to make its maximum so that the owner or the um, person doing all the work can have more time to do the other things that they love. And I know your audience is very engaged in fiction writing and that doesn't always pay a lot of money. So if you have a business and you want to um, free up more time for the creative side, I, I hope that there are some good ideas for you in this book. Oh, definitely. And so you've mentioned freeing up more time, uh, but what are the other reasons that people choose this way of life rather than, say, work in a typical job or the sort of entrepreneurial startup route? I think it's basically wanting to love their life and wanting control over how they spend their time. Time is our most precious commodity, right? We can't get any more of it. Um, and we can't get it back if we misspend it. And I think people often get to the point where maybe they get some experience in their chosen 
field working for someone else, but they're sitting in the conference room one day and somebody is grandstanding and the meeting is going on for three hours when it could have taken 10 minutes. And they're thinking, wow, I'd really love to be home with my children right now instead of wasting three hours of my life in this conference room. Or I, I'd love to be outside mountain biking. It's a beautiful sunny day. And if I worked for myself, I really could be doing that instead of listening to this. And and I think it starts to build in people where they, they start to realize, you know what, I know what I'm doing. I have a valuable service of some sort to offer, or I could come up with some type of product-based business and free myself from this whole system that really doesn't work for who I am right now. It may have worked at one point. A lot of times when people are young, their work is their social life. But at a certain point, you're meeting people in different ways. So you wouldn't really be isolated if you had a business. And I think it all starts to come together and and build up into becoming an entrepreneur. Mm. And you mentioned there about the importance of time. And uh, we're recording this at the beginning of May in 2020, uh, the time of coronavirus. <laughs> exactly. And, <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of people are probably assessing their life. A lot of people have been laid off, but also people who haven't been laid off um, will have more time to think about what they really want. So what what do you think the impact of this time is going to be on, on the sort of uh, the, the type of lifestyle you talk about? It's an interesting question, Joanna. I I think it's been a very stressful situation for people and tragic in many ways. But at the same time, it's been a gift because it's almost like we push the reset button on the world and had a chance to sort of think about, does the pace we're living at make sense? Are we just running from one thing to the next without any sort of mindfulness about our lives? And what really matters to us. I think a lot of people are part of these systems of school and work and other things that keep them apart from their families and their friends because they're all so busy. And now we've had a chance to not be so busy and enjoy time with our kids and our friends and our spouses and our partners that we haven't had before. And Mm. think about, you know, what, what do we want going forward? Do we want more of that going forward? Do we want more time to do work we love and less time doing work we don't love? Do we want more time just for quiet contemplation as opposed to just getting in the car and running to the next activity, whatever that is, or jumping on the subway or however you get places? I I think it's been a real gift. Yeah, and it's it's interesting, and uh, I, though I must I must say I really want to get out there and go traveling again. I feel like yes, I'm enjoying being at home, but boy, I would like to get out of here. <laughs> Oh, I know. Travel is, I think that's one of the things that people are really missing, but I think they'll appreciate it so much more when we're able to open the world back up again. However that looks, it might be a world where we're all wearing masks for a long time and gloves and other things. Um, but I but I think we're going to appreciate how precious that is, that, that we can travel and see the world Mm. And in fact, travel is one of the reasons I um, went full time creative entrepreneur back in 2011, because, uh, you know, as a writer, I, I get my inspiration from traveling and you just don't get enough time when you have a day job. Right. You have to you have to ask for leave. The asking permission for leave is something that drives me nuts. <laughs> Absolutely. It's funny because one of the things I felt when I first started my business in 2007 was that I finally could treat myself like an adult. I I felt like when I was an employee, I would always have to run things past my boss. Like my child needs speech therapy and I need to take half a day off to bring them to the doctor. Is that okay? When it was, of course, okay. I was their mother, you know, (laughs) and I should have been taking them to speech therapy, but I, but it, it had to be run through another adult who would say yay or nay. And, and there's something about that, that starts to wear on you. And I I think um, one of the great things is you can make all the decisions for yourself when you have your own business. You have the responsibility of bringing in income while you're traveling the world or taking your kid to speech therapy or doing whatever it is you've chosen to do. But you're in charge and not somebody else. Mm. And also, I guess, coming back to the coronavirus lockdown, uh, we've seen some businesses 
are very impacted, highly impacted. Let's take airlines, for example. (laughs) Airlines are are grounded, basically, but there are many businesses that are pivoting or changing. So of the businesses you talk about, these smaller businesses, um, which ones are the sort of most resilient and how are people pivoting to manage? People that are pivoting successfully are looking at what the market needs now instead of thinking about what they usually sell and trying to stick to that. That's what I'm seeing. Um, One example is Harry Ein, who I wrote about in the book. He runs a business called Perfection Promo. And what he does is sell swag. I don't know what it's called in the UK, but it's those t-shirts with the company's name on them or the pens you get at the bank with the bank's name on them. And he sells it to B2B customers, mostly to give out at events. Well, guess what? All the events are canceled, so he can't sell them right now. So he's pivoted. He, he was able to get supply of masks, and he's pivoted into selling the masks right now. And he's positioning himself for when businesses start to open up, the need to supply them with masks. So for instance, if a restaurant opens up, we don't know what that's really going to look like with the health codes, but he's assuming masks will be part of that. So he's figuring out how do I tap into that B2B market instead of my usual one. Um, Another woman that I've written about for Forbes, Elisa Shiro, is a million dollar one person event planner. And what she's done is pivoted into virtual events. And when I first spoke with her in the beginning, there was kind of a shock through the meetings and events industry because everything just suddenly came to a standstill. And this is how everybody makes their income. But she thought about it and she realized a lot of companies are having their quarterly meetings now. And it's just one Zoom call after another people droning on. It's getting boring. So she had a lot of celebrity contacts. So she started reaching out to the companies that had the meetings and saying, would you like a celebrity at your meeting to liven things up? And the celebrities are home and they're because they don't have to travel, they charge less to appear at a meeting than they would if they came and gave a keynote. So she's been um, arranging those kinds of meetings. And when I last was in touch with her, she was doing quite well. She was really busy booking virtual meetings. So that's, that's another example of kind of staying within her, her niche, but pivoting to this more virtual world that we're in. I'm also seeing some interesting pricing strategies. I just spoke, um, there were two brothers, the um, Weissman brothers, Albert and Boris, who live in Toronto, and they sell socks. They, the business is called Soxy, and they sell <laughs> very colorful men's socks with crazy prints and things like that. And they pivoted into women's socks too, and they sell shoes. They're a novelty gift. And people aren't as focused on that type of purchase right now. So what they did was change their pricing where if you pay full price for the socks, they will give a pair to a nurse. And I'm sure nurses are wearing through a lot of pairs of socks right now because <laughs> they're working nonstop. And and plus it probably brightens up the ward a little bit compared to the usual medical gear. Um, but if you can't afford it, you could take a 45% discount you could take, I think the other ones were 20% or 10% off. And what they did on their website was explain if you um, pay the 10% off, this is what your purchase goes toward. And if you pay the 20, this is what it goes toward, et cetera. So you could sort of see how it impacts the business because they've, since I wrote the book, they've now grown to 15 employees. They have a warehouse and they don't want to lay anybody off. So this is their strategy for keeping people employed, and it's been working so far. Um, So I think you've got to look at a lot of different aspects of your business to find how you will personally survive during this. And I'm sure there are some that have been unaffected because they do their work remotely. They're working for industries that really aren't affected, et cetera. But, But most of them have been in some way. Mm. Well, that's really interesting. So, uh, and I remember that kind of the first week or two of, of shock of going, oh my goodness, everything's changed. Oh no, I need to make some more money. Uh, you know, oh dear. And then as things settled down a bit, it was sort of, okay, you know, it's not a total disaster, especially for those of us with an online business. But the attitude you, ta- you talked about there was this kind of letting things go quickly and moving into a new idea, which is which is a really resilient um, uh, attitude, I guess. So what, what are some of the other attitudes that people who have these types of businesses have in common? 
Well, you, you did point to one thing that I just want to call out, Joanna, which is speed. That's one thing I noticed is everybody went into shock, but for most people, it, it was two weeks of shock. <laughs> for these folks, it was two days. Um, it, it, it was funny. One of, one of the entrepreneurs I profiled more recently, um, Sean Kelly, is a young entrepreneur. He dropped out of Rutgers University. He started a business selling rapper jerseys. He couldn't afford the sports jersey licenses so he was creative and he reached out to musicians and he built a million dollar one man business and he got into the mask business recently but it was like lightning mm. <laughs> compared to most people and i thought well wow, that's something i can learn from them because they don't they don't hesitate they have a really really strong bias to action and experimentation and if it doesn't work out so be it they'll move on to the next experiment and i think that's something we can all learn instead of kind of hanging on to what you were doing they realize it's a temporary situation but there's a lot of opportunity in the situation too um so i think that's definitely uh, one of the attitudes is just a bias toward speed um another thing that I observed when I was updating the book, it's coming out in paperback in January, 2021. So I went back to the sources. They are all optimizers. A lot of times when people read a book about starting a business or growing a business, they want five easy steps, right? Like you do these five <laughs> yes. things, you're going to be at a million and they're really simple. It's just a matter of one day's work, but that's not really the case. A lot of, some of these are 11 year overnight successes and some of them are one year overnight successes, but they optimize the resources they bring to the table personally. In some cases, it's their personality in some cases, it's their experience or connections from their industry. Some cases, they have a lot of startup capital. Some cases, they have good relationships with um, different types of outside financing. But they lean into whatever it is. They, they don't all have the same things, but they just have that tendency to make the most of whatever they have. And I think that's something we can all do more of. Instead of thinking about our deficits and what we don't have, use our strengths to get to where we want to go and and not let other people define your value. I think a lot of times when people leave a traditional work situation, maybe they were pushed out. Like a lot of people are being right now because of COVID-19. A lot of people are losing their jobs in countries all over the world. And that can hurt your self-esteem and make you feel like, well, maybe I had no value. Maybe I was wrong. I thought I was successful, but they didn't keep me. They kept someone else. In reality, it doesn't matter when you're an entrepreneur. It's up to you to define your own value. And we all have amazing strengths and gifts. And if you can find them within yourself and bring them to the marketplace, then it's up to the market to decide and you to decide, not a boss somewhere. So I think that's important too. And I think these folks have done that. They define their own worth instead of letting someone else tell them what they're worth in the marketplace. And obviously your worth isn't just what you're worth in the marketplace. We're all human beings and there's a greater, greater worth that we all have beyond that. Um, so they have that. A couple of other just more practical things, big users of automation. They don't waste a lot of time in their business on routine tasks like scheduling. Like I think you had a scheduling app and um, a lot of people are using tools like that. They're They're very... Uh, industry specific apps for every type of business that you can imagine. So what might work for an e-commerce won't necessarily work for a writing business, et cetera. Um, so it's important to reach out to other people in your field and find out what they're using. Cause you can see easily save one day a week if you put your mind to it by using time saving apps. And for a writer, imagine having one extra day a week where you could just sit down <laughs> and do your fiction Mm -hmm. or do your nonfiction, whatever you write. It's such a gift from the heavens <laughs> to have that time. <laughs> and uh, apps can give that to you. The other things that they're doing are using um, contractors to help them um, and using outsourcing, which are two different things. A contractor might be a web designer instead of designing the website yourself if you're not a designer. Um, outsourcing would be using fulfilled by Amazon if you're selling a product on 
on Amazon, for instance, so you're not packing up boxes yourself and doing things that you really don't need to do as a business owner. Sometimes people are hesitant to spend any money on these things, but it's hard to make money if you're just caught up in the weeds of the business. And I think that's a mindset shift that has to occur in in a lot of people before they can really get into the mid six figures and beyond, not, not kind of counting every penny, but thinking about the big picture. Um, and then one other, a couple of other things I noticed one, they are self educators. I always thought that mastermind groups were kind of a scam all these years. <laughs> and then when I heard how they use them, I realized they're not a scam at all. They're really valuable because they put people in a group of their peers and, and maybe people who are a little bit above them in terms of knowledge of their business. And it challenges them to grow. And it's a safe space where they can run ideas past other people who care about the same things. And I found a lot of them were in private masterminds or had a coach. They're believers in coaching. Uh, what happens a lot of times in um, small businesses is you can get to two hundred to maybe five hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue by working really hard, depending on the business. Just maybe you work seven days a week, but it will burn you out. And where they bring in a coach is to help them get past that zone, so that they can do things more efficiently and and get to the million in revenue. Um, by the way. The million dollars is to inspire people. These people have gotten to one million in the solo business, but for each person, your million might be different. So maybe you need 200,000 because you live in the country and the cost of living is low. There's no reason to arbitrarily go after one million if you don't need it. The idea is to create a life you want and have time and freedom, but a lack of financial scarcity, which is very distracting if you're trying to do creative work. Um, so I just wanted to say that because sometimes people think, oh, if I can't get to a million, it's not even worth trying. But <laughs> a million is is an inspirational number that can be achieved, as we see, but it's not the be all and end all. The, the final thing I would say is I noticed a lot of them are into some type of mindfulness practice. They're meditators or doers of yoga or other physical things that give them time for their brain to just clear so that they can be creative. And I think that's important for writers. There's so much in our minds that can be unleashed if we work on it and give ourselves space to do that. And these folks I, I see as very similar to writers and that they're very creative people and, and not by the book at all. <laughs> so I think that's a, that's a really important thing. I'm trying to learn how to meditate. I'm a pretty serious yoga student and I found that's pretty meditative, but the next level for me would be serious meditation, which I haven't had the patience to do yet. But when I see how many of these folks are meditators, I realize that's an important piece of the equation. Mm, that's so interesting. And I love what you said about the sort of the moving to the next level. And it's often, and the meditation probably goes into it, is that it's taking a step back and not doing so much. And this is something I struggle with very much. I'm a doer. I, I feel like my day is better if I have done more and ticked more stuff off my list. Like I love doing that. I like having stuff there. And yet I do achieve more if I have a more open calendar. So it's weird. It's like a paradox that if you have less to do, but you know where you're going with your bigger goals, you can get to that higher level of achievement instead of filling it with checking social media and doing this other thing and, you know, filling your time with sort of busy work instead of important work. So maybe the meditation side is stepping back and identifying what are the things that really, really move the needle instead of these tiny little, little things? I think you're right about that, Joanna. A number of them set aside a certain day during the week to work on things like research and development. And I think the meditation sets the stage for that or you know, having some sort of clearness in their life that's a, away from all the busy work is really important to that. And, and they are very strategic in their they're thinking about the business. A lot of times people in creative businesses are scrambling from one project to the next. It's how do I get the next project? And then how do I execute the next project? And how do I juggle a new one that just came in on top of that? 
if you're always in that mindset, your business will not grow and you'll never have a very peaceful business. It'll always be a mad scramble. And I think these folks have deliberately, for the most part, said no to that and decided to think more like entrepreneurs, very big picture, as you said. And they've put systems in place to make that happen, like taking Friday off to do R&D. And writers can do research and development, too, with creative projects. It, it, it's different when you're doing fiction, right, because it's an art than, it's, uh, than running an e-commerce business, for instance, right, which is a totally commercial enterprise. But there are some similarities mm. where maybe you'll do something experimental on your Friday off from your normal stuff that you do. But you'll never do that experimental stuff if you don't allow yourself the time to do it. Mm. Yeah. And in fact, for many people listening, probably that experimental stuff is the writing uh, and they've got a day job in there um, as their main sort of money, but they might want to go further. So let's look at that. So going further into the models, you have a lot of different um, business types within the book, uh, sort of the different categories of these different businesses. And obviously you've mentioned socks and swag, which are physical products, but you also have the informational content creation model, which is definitely what I do. But some of the, what are some of the ways that authors can turn their words into more than just a book? Oh, there are so many different ways, Joanna. Um, one, one great source of ideas is ClickBank, which is a marketplace for informational products. There are different things that people are releasing. Um, you could do a course. A lot of authors are very good teachers because the nature of the work they do. A lot, of, a lot of people that write fiction have jobs that are in things like marketing, journalism, other related fields where they're using those writing skills. And we're explainers. Mm. So those explaining skills translate very well to creating a course on a platform like Teachable or Podia or one of the other ones. You might have something that you know it doesn't have to be writing related, by the way. It could be knitting or fixing dishwashers or whatever you know how to do that you could turn into a course and, and sell. You could create a community. I consider that part of informational content creation. There are paid communities. Um, you can create a mastermind group, as I said. I'm now a believer in them. Um, <laughs> Or, or, or it doesn't have to be a mastermind. There, you could do a one-time course. Sometimes I'm seeing people now doing a lot of things on Zoom um, paid programs where you're assembling uh, people you've curated who have expertise in a certain subject matter and people pay a certain amount to subscribe to uh, that event. Um, there, there are also other things that you can do um, one of the things that was kind of interesting, because you're a podcaster, Jamie J is one of the entrepreneurs that I've added to the book. I've added more professional services businesses in the update, and he runs a podcasting agency that does custom podcasts as well as hosting his own podcast. Mm. And what he did was he assembled a bunch of virtual assistants who have specialized skills in podcast related things like one does graphic design to create all the little images and icons to promote a podcast and then others know the technical stuff so he's not doing that work he's the one who runs the business and what he does is charge a flat fee for access to those services so it's more of a service business but they're also creating some informational products like the little icons and the social media posts and things like that. So there are hybrid approaches too, but what has enabled the business to grow was going from one-off projects to more of like a flat retainer fee for the clients and doing it well. He got a lot of positive reviews on the internet, which then brings in a lot of organic business without him having to be out there hustling it up, which can take a lot of time for, for entrepreneurs um, speaking is another type of informational content creation. A lot of writers are good speakers. I think there's a myth that they're so shy and reserved that they can't speak. Whenever I hear writers, I think they're great. They're great communicators <laughs> and they're sincere. You know, sometimes I don't like the model of the gung ho chess beating motivational speaker. Oh, it I know what you it mean. Seems, <laughs> it's so fake, you know, and, and writers are so sincere. And I think people like 
that genuineness. So I would say don't underrate yourself as a speaker. If you have written books or you're a journalist or some other type of writer, a lot of people are aspiring writers and would love to hear from you. And you can charge for speaking. It's important to be aware of that because a lot of times people are so honored to speak. They never think to ask for a speaking fee, but many places have a budget for their speakers. Like if a university invites you to speak, they may have a budget. And if you don't ask, they're not going to mention it. But if you do ask, they'll say, oh, yes, well, this is what we pay. So, (laughs) So speak up for yourself because as a writer, you have bills too. Even if you love your work, it doesn't mean you shouldn't be paid for it. Mm, no, there's some great tips there. And um, it is interesting you mentioned that about the speakers. I agree with you. Men, you know, I'm an introvert and many of my listeners are introverts. That doesn't mean we're shy. Uh, but I, I agree that sometimes you can be, you can just be you. You can be a, a, a quiet type of person and still speak effectively because you're serving an audience and perhaps because you listen more than the um, gung-ho motivational speaker. You can actually do a better job. <laughs> I think so, too. I I do think that today's speaker has to have a two-way conversation with the audience. And I think sometimes shy and introverted people are better listeners, as you say, Joanna. And it's a better experience for the audience than somebody putting on a show. Sometimes we need a show. It's fun walking on coals or something like that. But (laughs) but I think I think today people are used to more off the cuff speaking. They see it on social media videos. They see it on LinkedIn, other places like that. And they're kind of tired of the canned approach. So the genuine writer approach, I think has a lot of shelf life right now. Mm, I agree. And I, I think podcasting is that too. You know, people are listening to our voices for, for sort of 40 minutes and they know us more and this is not polished. You know, we're we're just talking. So that's good. But I, I wonder about that because the reality is there's a lot of books out there. There's a lot of online businesses, a lot of speakers, a lot of everything. <laughs> so how can we become a memorable brand uh, so we can make uh, good money this way? I think it has to do with really owning a small niche. All of us have some area that we geek out on where when we start talking, maybe our family starts going in the other room (laughs) because we think about it so obsessively and they're tired of hearing about it. But that's usually your area where you have something interesting to say. If you're kind of obsessed with something, that means you're going to bring originality to it because you're constantly turning it over in your head. And I think when you have that level of interest, you're probably not unique. There probably are other people in the world that share it and would love to talk about it with you for the next six hours if they could also. And when you can identify that in yourself, and I think every person has that, you're onto something as far as a podcast topic. So for instance, in entrepreneurship, I've always written about entrepreneurship, both scalable businesses and one person businesses. But one of my editors at Forbes noticed I always seem more passionate writing about the one person business. And I don't know exactly why. I think it was partly because it was relevant to me because I'm a mother with four children and I needed some way to run a business from home. And that was how I got interested in it. But I also felt like it was this huge neglected area in entrepreneurship reporting. So many of the um, reporters in my field focus on who's the next Facebook or the Mm, next Zoom or whoever it is. (laughs) Exactly. But but the vast majority of small businesses around the world are one person businesses and they weren't even really being considered businesses. There were a lot of business studies that didn't even count them unless they had employees. And I thought it was a tremendous oversight. And after years and years of reporting, I felt like I know this field as well as anybody who's covering it because I've spent my whole adult life pretty much covering this at this point. And I think it's neglected and I'm going to write about it. And and other people recognize, I think, that it wasn't really being covered and they liked the feeling that their type of business was being counted. And I think that was how things coalesce around the book. When I when I wrote articles about this topic for Forbes, they would go viral. And it told me that th- this was a, a niche that 
was being untapped and that I could fill. And so I think there are for every writer, there probably is something like that where you really know the subject well and you have a slightly different point of view than other people. I think that's important too. You don't want to have the same view as everyone else on whatever your topic is, because that means there is going to be so much competition and it will be hard to move the conversation forward. You want to look for an area where you can add something to the conversation based on your knowledge, your experience, your unique situation, whatever that might be. It might be that you're located in a specific geographic area that gives you a new perspective, but the key is finding that difference. Mm. And uh, I guess, yeah, you've mentioned there about your own writing process. You've spent years writing about entrepreneurship and you, that you've you distilled this into the book and obviously you've just updated it for the paperback. But I know what happens with nonfiction and particularly with interviews. You end up with this mass of material. So I wondered if you could give any uh, tips or how you turned m- a, m- a huge amount of research into a coherent, uh, easy to read book. It's funny, Joanna, I use the same methods that I use when I'm a ghostwriter or a writing coach. And I remind myself that every book is really not about the author. It's about the reader. And every book is a conversation with the reader. So when I was making decisions about what to include and what not to include, I would always ask myself, what is the experience for the reader like? And with a book like this, where I'm writing, there were more than 30 different types of businesses that I wrote about in the book. There are six main categories, but each each business was different. So even if I was writing about, I think I wrote about five e-commerce businesses, each one of those runs differently. I could have gone really into the weeds about how each one ran. And that would have satisfied some readers who want to do exactly what that person did. But I also had to think about, I'm a storyteller I want the book to be entertaining. I don't want it to be like reading a textbook. Mm. And I want the reader to feel the stories, not just have a laundry list of steps to follow, put up a website, incorporate your business. (laughs) And so I had to make certain creative decisions about it that balance those two things. And I think, you know, you've done a good job with that when some people are complaining about, the decisions that you've made. Like I had one person post on um, Amazon that I should have had stuff about um, accounting in there, like like how, how to balance your books and that sort of thing. But that wasn't what the book was about. Anybody can get an accounting textbook if you want to learn how to do your quick, but this wasn't going to be that book mm. because I, I, I wanted to inspire people and let them know this is possible. These are real people just like you who have gotten to 1 million Here are the basics of what they did, knowing that in real time it was changing. I mean, when I updated it, so many things had changed with with each person because technology changed, people's life situation changes, the amount of time they can devote to the business changes, the market demand changes. So there's not a static set of things that I can recommend that someone can just copy and achieve the same results with any business. And I know there are people selling systems like that, but I really don't believe that they work after interviewing thousands of entrepreneurs over the years. Mm. Everything has to be a constantly evolving process, just like writing, writing fiction. It, you know, if someone teaches you everything that they did to write a great short story that wins the push cart prize, you still can't necessarily do it. <laughs> yeah, you otherwise we'd all be winning out. them. <laughs> Exactly. So you've got to, you've got to just go through the process and the process is what teaches you and what works for you one time might not work another time. And people, I don't think they like to think that, that there's sort of a magic to it all, but there kind of is with everything moving in the right direction, the person having the right mindset at the right time, everything aligning. But, but a lot of things in life are like that. But at the same time, you can set the stage where it's more likely to happen. Yeah, and, absolutely. And that's what this is about. Yeah. Mm. 
No, well, I think it's a brilliant book. And as you say, it's very easy to read. And actually, that circles back to what we said at the at the top about maybe it's what you leave out and the time you spend to step back and think about what people really need. And that's what you did with the book. So I can highly recommend uh, the million dollar one person business. So uh, Elaine, where can people find you and the book and everything you do online? Um, Joanna, they can find me on LinkedIn under my full name, Facebook under my full name, um, Twitter full name, or I have a website, the million dollar one person business written out in words or another website under my full name. (laughs) (laughs) And they have a contact box on them. I do write back. So if you have any questions and would like to reach out, I, I love getting letters from people who have heard me on podcasts or read the book. And I'm happy to answer questions. Sometimes people need to troubleshoot a business idea and want to run a past someone. I'm happy to do that. No charge. Just because I feel like it makes me a better journalist, understand what questions people have and and what concerns they have. I just um, sold a new book called Tiny Business, Big Money to Norton. And I'm looking at businesses at that slightly next stage where they have a very tiny crew you know, maybe a handful of contractors or even one or two employees and how that all works together. All people over a million dollars in revenue as well, but who have that additional people challenge. So I'm particularly interested at this moment in time in hearing from people who are wrestling with that. Like, how do I find great contractors that I trust? Or how do I manage my two people and create a culture when it's just three of us? (laughs) And that that kind of thing really interests me. So um, please uh, get in touch. I welcome any notes that you send. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Elaine. That was great. Oh, thank you so much, Joanna. You asked great questions. It was a pleasure to talk with you. And I'm so honored you've been a podcaster for so long you're really one of the leaders in your field and it's really an honor to be here so i hope you found the discussion with elaine useful today i loved hearing that successful entrepreneurs have a strong bias for action and experimentation and self-learning which is essentially what underpins the indie author movement and i hope today gave you some ideas and inspired you now back to writing craft next week i'm talking about how character flaws shape story with will store author of the science of storytelling now i've always struggled with the whole character flaw thing uh, and how that integrates with plot in a way that doesn't seem overly contrived. But Will explains this really well. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>